All right, well, we'll just get started and she'll join us eventually. So today we thought we'd start, um, Joseph is going to offer us a summary. Oh, wait, are you going to start with the, Joseph had a question about how to effectively read Shakespeare. So I think we decided we'll start with that mm -hmm. and then move to a summary. Um, well, you also and, had some questions along those lines too, so. And I have some related questions about yeah. how to effectively read Shakespeare, so. Okay, so Joseph, let's let's hear your question. Or is that just the question? No, no, I, I had, um, so I did something that inconsistently worked well. Uh, so I wanted to share what I found helpful and then use as a foil to hear some tips on what you would recommend, Andrew. So in the book, I'm, I'm reading a Kindle version, which I think is a mistake, but one thing that it has that's nice is every so often there's a little link I can tap on and it, essentially provides a translation. So it kind of, here's either some, sometimes I get lucky and it's like, here's a little context for what's going on. And what I found is if I read that whenever it's there, I can then enjoy the language a lot more. Mm -hmm. So I'm oriented around what's happening, but if it's not there, I'm struggling so much just to try and understand what's happening, that I'm getting none of the, the poetry or the value of the, mm -hmm. the language. So, um, one of the questions is like do you recommend or is it all right to read a summary of each scene or mm -hmm. act like what i'm almost wanting is uh somebody to read the scene to me and then interject with so here's what's happening after a few lines and then mm -hmm. I, or, or even give me a little context and kind of this interwoven in between I, I mean i did find the last scene of this act in particular very clear and easy to, maybe because of the nature of the drama that was happening mm -hmm. but but so much of it I'm lost, like, you know, is, is going over my head because I'm just in the weeds on, you know, last week I tried going line by line translating. Lisa recommended I, this week I tried just reading it through and then rereading it again, mm -hmm. which in theory worked, but I only had time to read it once. So, okay, got, so. <laughs> got one reading. So yeah. yeah, I'm curious if you've, what, what do you recommend for, for something? Because I'm, especially as you guys talk about it and I get glimpses of it, this, it's incredible. It like mm -hmm. I can see how every modern drama and like Game of Thrones is really just Shakespeare retold. <laughs> and I want to go to source material now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I want to be able to really enjoy the language of it too. So th that's kind of the basis of my question, and um, yeah. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Um, well, I think there are any there are a number of ways to go about reading the reading a, a Shakespeare play for the first time. I, I do like um this the Folger layout here uh because it's got the notes on the side with so you can look at them when you need to very easily but they don't distract I find I don't think they they distract you don't have to flip to find them and so often they'll be they'll be important they'll, they'll give you that the kind of thing you're looking for so I think it's really good to have uh an addition like that um I also you discourage I I'd, I'd like to hear um how you contrast that with the side by side Shakespeare which I know you were you discouraged where it translates each line into plain language what do you see as the disadvantage of that um I haven't I have I guess I haven't done it my suspicion though is that you end up the the language will the 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 uh, the no fear Shakespeare sort of thing will um it'll it'll be your first encounter with the with the way things are said and uh, the way the way the drama is being expressed and mm -hmm. uh, it will it will tend to de-elevate it i think mm -hmm. so that's i think it's good to have a summary that's why you know i wanted you to read the the charles lamb yeah. version there are um there are some other ones that give you the whole story so that you can kind of picture some like what's going on in this act, I think through something like that, I think that's good to read ahead of time um, mm -hmm. and then to use the the helpful notes, but to to actually be encountering it in a language itself. I think listening to an audio book could be great. It would be a mm -hmm. great way of doing it if you want to listen to it, um, listen to it read well, but then go back over it yourself at once you've had that. That would be a really effective way to do it. Um, so a, a little, couple... Sorry, even though, and even though I think that um, that you really want to fully experience Shakespeare by 
by seeing it performed, um, at least for really entering into it from the beginning, in the beginning, I prefer you listen to an audio version that's not going to so much shape how you how you see it ahead of time. But if um, but watching it, seeing it performed is another way of of entering into it so that you can read it more effectively. Mm -hmm. I think this this was the first scene of the three that I felt I didn't actually go through with it, but I felt compelled to go find a performance and mm -hmm. and watch it because the the scene where he's ranting in the storm in the middle, so much of the dialogue there was impenetrable to me. I just, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I didn't know how much I was supposed to know what was going on or how much it was just supposed to be emotionally mm -hmm. evocative and stormy. And, and so I thought, well, maybe if I see this, um, because it, I had a very difficult time conjuring it in my own mind. Mm -hmm. Um, if I can take a couple of minutes for a question. I think that's... this is one of the most difficult scenes in Shakespeare. In, in okay. Different, difficult that makes me feel better. For that, yes. Yeah, okay. Because um, we're descending into madness. Mm -hmm. So you've got you've got madness coming out in all in all kinds of ways. And um, and that's hard to to visualize that until you see it performed. Okay. I did wonder if that was true. So um this is a little bit self-absorbed of a question so I'll I'll try to keep it short but the question so Joseph it's relating to your question what would be the ideal presentation of Shakespeare that would be the, the great kind of first introduction to it I completely see why having the side-by-side -side, no fear Shakespeare translate it into plain language it feels like what you'd end up doing is defaulting to the plain language version just taking in the bare plot without the nuance and grandeur and um, poetry of the language. And so even though, even if you committed yourself to reading both side by side, I can see how you would just continually gravitate towards the thing that felt more accessible. And that feels dangerous to me. Mm -hmm. um, the, at the, but at the same time, on the other side, there were so, this scene, one of my struggle, or this act, one of my struggles was that I often felt bogged down. I don't, I mean, ten, almost ten, I felt tense with my own incomprehension and like it was a real struggle. And so I was unable in certain parts to really get any meaningful uh, kind of the spiritual value of literature out of it because I was working so hard to understand it. Now, mm -hmm. so Joseph many of you have participated in other read with me activities and Joseph has sat in on many of my classes at school and with the seventh and eighth graders when we, we read a play it's not Shakespeare it's usually um, accessible language but the themes are abstract and inac inaccessible to them and there's subtlety to the dialogue that's inaccessible to them so we read it out loud together and mm -hmm. I stop as Joseph was longing for in this every uh, once in a while to establish what's going on. But what this is the um, Cliff's Notes versus Read With Me distinction that I find so interesting and that I wonder how it would apply here is that when I'm giving commentary, explaining things to my students or doing commentary on the books, it's unapologetically enthusiastic. It's not just here is what happened. I'm making this mm -hmm. intelligible to you. It's here is what is so beautiful and amazing about this. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would want in a guide. I don't know how it would be tricky because you have to do that without making it too subjective a response, I think. But but I would love a, a side by side like this that translates a few key things that they know are going to be unintelligible to you and somehow establishes the significance it communicates the significance of what's happening in that scene in impassioned tones that's that's <laughs> what I, I don't think that exists but that's mm -hmm. what i would like to exist yeah heather Oh, I don't know if it exists for Shakespeare, but it reminds me of one that Nicholas, you might remember reading, um, uh, was it the Iliad and the Odyssey? And it had in the margin just a, a five word summary of what was happening every few paragraphs. 
Mm. And I found that that made it really easy to follow. Like, oh, mm. Lear just, you know, asked for them to tell him whatever. And, you know, mm. just a few words in the margin. And I think that that would have been really helpful. I found it helpful in this just to have the little summary at the beginning of the scene to say, here's what's going to happen. And then I could say, oh yeah, that's what that was. I found it helpful, you... but I still felt lost <laughs> even with that uh, often, yeah. At school, I would always read the cliff notes scene by scene um like plot description because that one's it's pretty in like it's just like bare bones fact but it's more descriptive than the scene descriptions here and I would read that before and then read the scene which is not ideal but at least you have somewhat of a map of what's going on so you're not completely lost through it well that's a step above the side by side in the sense that if you treat it as I'm going to read the whole scene description in advance then put that away not be referring from one to the other that seems better it's, and also the scene descriptions are not they're not super descriptive they're like a paragraph or, or so so it, to me that was the right amount where like that gave me enough context to know what was going on but it wasn't trying to like it wasn't trying to tell you the story it was just trying to mm -hmm. kind of get you acclimated I'll make one suggestion that I'd be very interested if it exists. Because um, one thing I've been conscious of as I've been thinking of the value of Read With Me and then where I'm getting bogged down here is, you know, the experience with Read With Me is when getting into a new book, um, unfamiliarity can quickly compound into just feeling dejection and no motivation to continue. And I felt that a lot and very acutely here is. I'll, I'll read through it and I'll find myself at the end of the page and just like, oh, I, I did not absorb anything from that. And now it's a big oh. question of do I persevere or do I, without knowing what's happening or start again, but now do I have time for that? Mm -hmm. And read with me, we have these focus summaries. So even if I'm loosely following it, at the very least, Lisa's given me the essentials. Mm -hmm. And so what and then contrasting that with Lisa and and the group discussion of plays, which I really like. So I'm wondering, is there anything that exists with not full summaries, but little like interjections mm -hmm. in the text to keep you, because because that's the biggest danger is you read too much without mm -hmm. knowing what's happening, mm -hmm. and you start to feel the the motivation sway. But if you had something that just kind of keeps giving you drips of summaries, and, and maybe the side by side offers that i'm curious um because i, it, it I think sounds, I, I have the kindle version it sounds like a blend of of greta's process and heather's iliad experience is what you you'd be wanting where you have a general orientation to the scene ahead so you know basically what to expect from what's happening you put that aside you read it and then in I, I like the idea of a page where it's in the margin, even the act of having to flip back from this page to this page feels distracting. I like the idea of just something right in the margin there. When they know you're you're gonna, they know Joseph is gonna start losing patience. They put a little <laughs> put a little note there to or, to remind you what's happening. Just to be clear, so Joseph. Andrew, uh, oh go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, um, I'm, I guess, are you, are you asking about like literally what's going on in the scene? Like where are people standing? You know, how are the movements going? Like what's the flow of the scene? Or are you more saying like they're using words that I don't know what they mean? Cause like, like my version that I have has a lot of footnotes in the bottom and it'll kind of explain um, when he says, for example, there's a line where the fool says thy wit shall not go slipshod. And then there's a footnote at the bottom of the page that says slipshod means slippered. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of notes like that. It'll just be a couple of words that they use that sound really strange and kind of maybe it's just archaic. Like we don't talk that way now. Um, and I find reading versions with a footnote, at least maybe it's not explaining what's going on in the scene very well. And maybe it's not explaining what the fool means when he's saying this or whatever it is. But at least there's a, a, like a easier version of whatever that word is i don't know if that makes any sense oh yeah we I and we have yeah. that in our in this in the version that we're all using um but i think it's the meaning of the of what <laughs> the full saying that's the that's the it's the step but further. also you know andrew made a point that 
because I, I think I asked something similar a couple of weeks ago and you said, well, when you see it live, it is a little easier. And I can imagine that because we're being asked to do a, a lot of mental gymnastics right now in terms of just language, but also who are they facing when they're talking? I'm sure that, you know, that conveys, those cues convey meaning. When they go aside, I bet when you're seeing it live, they turn away and talk to them. So you don't have to read aside and reorient yourself yeah. and then, you know, hold that in your head. So I can imagine seeing it too, just spatially where people are and how they're facing each other would probably help. Um, so I guess the next question is, Andrew, when are we getting the read with me version of King Lear recorded <laughs> by you? That'd be with fun. The ideal thing that we want. That's great. <laughs> I want That'd Andrew great. recorded um, this way with the ideal interjections. <laughs> let, me, let me just uh, check. Uh, now, Joseph, I know you've been struggling along, but mm -hmm. um, Act Three was much harder than mm -hmm. Act Two. Is that right? Yes, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, the end was not. The end was some of the easiest, yeah, most clear that, stuff I read in Shakespeare so far. Yeah. So. Um, but the the Act Three, I'm just going to say, Act Three is like the craziest scene in Shakespeare. <laughs> it's the hardest to imagine this. Uh, and so don't judge the rest of it by by your experience in Act 3. We'll have to see what Act 4 and Act 5 bring. I think that it's going to come out of that. Um, uh, I think that the, there, there are any number of ways to do it. I think that one of the best ways is to be reading it aloud with a group, uh, with mm. a small group, like mm. we did the first scene. Um, mm. Reading it aloud with a small group where you can stop and talk to one another about what's going on and, and then help each other. So that's yeah. probably the, the the best. Um, if you're by yourself hearing and you're finding a real trouble, then hearing it in an audio version is is a is a great way to do it. Uh, one of the reasons I'm I'm cautious about video versions and um, particularly video versions is that there's so much of Shakespeare of performing it that relies upon the interpretation of the director and the actors and what they want to accomplish. So it's very you have to be cautious and about about that. Um, if you if you feel like you're good at you're okay with watching a, a, a version and then going back and reading it and not letting that version dominate you, yeah. then that's fine. But that's very difficult not to do. And they and I think that most of the Shakespeare um, most of the Shakespeare productions that you'll find tend to involve Sometimes interpretations, sometimes stagey things that they think are going to make Shakespeare relevant, or or it's going to it's going to entertain the audience or connect mm -hmm. with that. I I just don't trust very many of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess is what I'd say. So that's why I'm 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 cautious about that. I um, completely relate to that concern, and I'd feel like I'd want a fair mastery of the play before I saw a performance of it for that reason, because. Um, with the plays that I know deeply and love, someone, people ask me all the time, what's your favorite performance of Cyrano de Bergerac? And I always say the one that plays in my head. Um, it's <laughs> no performance I've ever seen will satisfy me because I've got a better one up here. Um, so I like to get to that. And then I can still enjoy them, but I'm enjoying them through the filter of what, what I think is wrong. You've um, yeah. said it's had for a while. Yeah, no, just on the topic of seeing it performed, I was lucky enough in 2007 to see uh, Sir Ian McKellen perform King Lear in London, but I went in completely cold, like didn't mm. even know the story. And I can say I barely understood a word of it. Mm. <laughs> However, I submit, I mean, I fully take your point that you can have people with their agenda and the way they perform things. But I submit the best way to see it is film, because you in a in a theatre, if you don't have a good enough seat, no. if you're not right right in the stalls at the front, especially some of these old London theatres, you can be behind a post, you can be around the corner, you can be quite far back. <laughs> you you you'll barely not hear a lot of it, let alone really know what's going on. Mm. But a well produced film, you're you've got the best seat in the house for every single delivery. And if it's produced well, then every bit of lighting, every bit of music, every bit of makeup, every bit of staging 
adds to the conveying of the point that's being made. And my personal favorite is Kenneth Branagh, because when I watch Kenneth Branagh read Shakespeare, I feel like he does all the work for me. Mm. And I just get to enjoy the beauty of it because he takes away all the pain of having to understand it because he just makes it understandable. Mm. Even if I don't understand every word, he conveys it in such a way with such a staging, with such a performance, with such a emphasis of the words that I just get what he's saying. And it takes all the pain away somehow. Mm. I, I do yeah, like the thing you, you it, want to you want to after this experience, or maybe you want to do it before next time, but watch watch a watch. version. Yeah. Watch something, uh watch a presentation of it. Um I often mm -hmm. like the the amateur productions um as well often if they're good, if they're good quality amateur productions, because they um I don't know, they, they put a love and enthusiasm into it that I really appreciate. Can I just add that, that I agree with what Ian said? I just want to add one more value to like uh, the reasons he stated why the video is very good is also that uh, if you watched a hundred productions of of King Lear, I predict that ninety five of them would be terrible or not that great, and then a few would be wonderful. For example, I I took the trouble to see five or six video versions, and four of them were intolerable. Like no. they were so bad that it, I just could not proceed. And so I just selected two that I that I thought were terrific and they have greatly enhanced. So I'm not having any of the problem that Joseph is mentioning because mm -hmm. I have in front of me the scenes as they are happening. So even if I don't understand what that line is, I, I it's incomprehensible to me how you would not know what's going on because I've seen it on film. Mm -hmm. and, and because I have the subtitles going and the subtitles are... Um, uh, are exactly Shakespeare's words and therefore there is no like uh, it's not like they have dumped it down or they have I mean when you see Anthony Hopkins dating these venomous dialogues and he's growling you know he actually starts to growl like a wolf and he presents it then we mm -hmm. don't say oh this is like a tedious duty should I labor on trying to understand this or mm -hmm. you know that that sort of thing doesn't come to mind so okay. Anyway, so maybe that's my two experimenting, cents. experimenting with some sort of back and forth like I was tempted to do this mm -hmm. time to read it first, um, not have my first encounter be with the film and do the best I can with the method we've sort of patched together here and then watch a film scene. That's that sounds or that try sounds it, right? You might try it. So my conclusion uh, is be it'd be interesting to try watching an act a version of Act Four before you read it and see then see what next week what, mm -hmm. what that's like. And, that well, would, I, and one, I think we need next is uh, we need Andrew's interjected translation copy plus his favorite video version. Yeah. Um, so that we can and avoid the option. incomprehensible. One more option yes. to throw in the mix: um, the Archangel recordings. They're audio only, but with professional actors and sound effects. Mm -hmm. Okay. and some music and okay. so then you don't get so much visual interpretation but you can kind of piece together what's happening just by the audio and it's really well done so that's another option um molly um, where would we find these okay can, can molly can you please give some details how I, do we find what you're recommending i bought it i bought the whole set on amazon as a set of cds that was 20 years ago so i imagine Archangel. another format now Archangel is the name of the uh, publisher. Okay. Should we move uh, on to a summary? Well, I still have my, there are other aspects to my question. Okay. So I want to do those now. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. So this is going to be Lisa's completely mortifying confessions. I'm just going to, I'm just going to be totally upfront with a couple of things I, I was thinking about this week. One is that sometimes I'll be reading in this act, especially, and I'll feel a real sense of satisfaction, like, oh, wow. And then I'll reflect on the satisfaction and the satisfaction amounts to, I understood what was going yeah. on. <laughs> Okay, so I'm seeing nods, so people relate to this. And then I think, well, but is that the real? I mean, it just feels like such an amateurish or primitive or childish kind of sense of satisfaction instead of the real emotional yeah. impact that I'm supposed to get okay, from so it. So another thing to, to think, to realize here is that um, Shakespeare, 
Shakespeare packs a lot into mm -hmm. his words and mm -hmm. into his plays and into his drama. Um, so in some ways, get, you get, you have to get into Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. He's not he's not going to be um, something that on the surface is um, I don't know is, is as gripping or grabbing right away as as a novel. Um, mm -hmm. In some ways, it's more like reading Aristotle mm -hmm. or or um, reading philosophy or poetry or right. or poetry. Yeah, or poetry. Yeah. It is poetry. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it's like reading yeah. poetry in that you have to you have to work your way into it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it is something that builds up over time. Okay. You get you get used to things. But um, it, there is a kind of commitment that you say. I, I think that Shakespeare is, is uh, uh, people say, and I think Shakespeare, I've seen enough of it that I, I hope this is really going to be an amazing thing, mm. but it means you're going to want to do more work with it. You're going to have okay. to do more work with it than, than you will no, with that's... a novel. A novel, a novel fills things out for you all the time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Shakespeare is more packed. Another thing about Shakespeare that's, that's like that is he is so... He's so good at presenting things as they are, even in these heightened situations, presenting people and a mm -hmm. wide variety of people as they are. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's more like, it's kind of like sitting down and look, thinking about all the people you know and wondering what they're like and what their motivations are. Why are they doing the things they are? Shakespeare's presenting them to you with kind of that... Mm, that uh close close so close to reality that it's it has a complexity a complexity uh, of character and action that we we need to sort through over and uh, thinking about it for a long time i mm, think mm. no that's that is actually already really helpful i think because it informs what my goal should be when i'm reading it because i think i came into this thinking maybe naively thinking I've never really succeeded in connecting deeply with Shakespeare. So this time I'm going to read it in a way that allows me to do that. But that sounds over ambitious for the first play that I read this time. I should do my best to understand what's going on, figure, you know, experience the value that I can where I find it, yes. but not expect it to be hugely emotionally, spiritually impactful because I know now you have to do that a bunch of times and see it performed and do all the things that we were talking about before you're going to get to that point. So I think um, mod moderating my expectations mm -hmm. is probably important. But hopefully um, and that's a similar experience to what, well, it's a similar experience that I had with, you know, when I started Les Mis last year is I, my first ambition was enjoy it like Lisa enjoys it. Then I had to change my expectations to, okay, I'll be satisfied if I can just understand what happened and everything else is gravy. And that's mm. been my experience with, with King Lear so far too, is like, can I just understand the plot? And then mm. I'm getting to experience some thrilling moments now, especially this last scene or mm. last scene of the act. And to me, that's gravy. Well, and um, then, and I just have... then, then hearing somebody who's excited about it, talk about it. Yeah. If you've already gone through this um, initial experience, they'll be able to pull build on the things for you. Right. Um, um, which is something I think that, that actually leads into my second question. I just wanted to say quickly that now Joseph is at the point that I think Les Miserables is, has been life altering for him. And he just told me he's five days away from the end and he's going to read the final chapter at Victor Hugo's house in Paris next week. Whoa. <laughs> the day so, I land is the last chapter because I'm doing the chapter a day. So it just awesome. Coincidentally. Yeah, yeah coincidentally. I didn't time it. <laughs> just happens. So he Victor has Hugo been, would have been pleased. He, Hugo yeah. would have been pleased. Yeah. He's he's a convert now. Um so the second question that I guess maybe can be a transition into the act itself is uh stepping back from the act what were the big kind of impactful takeaway scenes or moments or or lines for people if you're just taking a bird's eye view on it 
what would an enthusiast say about what's so moving about this act? So we don't have to answer that right now, but that was the other. I tried to do that a little bit myself and I struggle that more with this act than I have with previous ones, but I there's some. Um, Kent versus Regan and Goneril is mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> the moral character contrast. Yeah. Um, I think that, that with this act, what should what you what might you what should stick with us most um, or is foundational is you've got just insanity mm -hmm. everywhere. You've got an old man who's who's losing his mind uh, because of what's happened to him in the midst of this enormous storm. Nature is going crazy as well. You have mm -hmm. him together with a fool who's you know who's not with it altogether at any time. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. But he's got a lot of, uh, and he's not normal. The fool is just not normal. He's mm -hmm. smart, but not normal. Mm -hmm. You've got Edgar, who is pretending to be uh, plagued, in, kind of insane and plagued by these demons. And so he's he's generating crazy yeah. language yeah. Uh, while he's in disguise. And he's also afraid, you know, he's vastly afraid of being caught since mm -hmm. everybody in the country is looking for him. And then his father comes in, who's the one who's after him the most. Mm -hmm. um, his father then and Kent are dealing, try to deal with all of this while they've mm -hmm. got the craziness of, of, the, of what's going on with Regan and Goneril and, and um, uh, Cornwall and their, and their whole different version of insanity. So it's, it's all of this together that I think we, we want to try to take in in terms of your imagining of it and then start to look at the lines and the meaning of the lines in that context mm -hmm. it was quite a surprise to see Gloucester rise so nobly to the occasion in this act I hadn't seen that coming but he was um I don't know one of the stepping back from it one of the things that I was thinking about was just the the people who make declarations of love versus, versus the people who show acts of love. Um, because there was that line, that chilling line where Cornwall, I think, says to um, Edmund, after Edmund betrays his father and Cornwall says, I'll be more of a father, I'll, I'll be more of a father to you than your own father is. And oh, it's just, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing of a real relationship there. It's just contemptible on from every angle. And then you have um, Kent. Oh gosh, what was the line from Kent that almost killed me? It was, uh, I can find it quickly. Oh, Lear says, wilt break my heart. And he says, I'd rather break mine own. Uh, <laughs> so the, um, the ones who are in disguise silently or, or exiled silently, engaged in real acts of love and the, then the ones that speak volumes of it like Goneril and Regan and Edmund and mean nothing. Mm -hmm. I think the just the in connection to that, that Lisa I just wanted to mention uh I I got that Kent line too and I thought that was so awesome mm -hmm. and uh, this is another Kent line that I really liked was when uh Edgar <clears throat> like first comes into the scene Oh no, like he he's making like a uh he's going on another like tangent and he's doing more insane talking. And then you would think like Kent and like the others would react to Edgar, but then Kent just says after hearing Edgar's exhortation, he says, How fair is your grace? So he's checking in on Lear and mm -hmm. not so much worrying about you know Edgar. And this is line of 132 in scene, uh, well, you know, four, the, the, the big one. So mm -hmm. another good count line, I would say. Good, that's a good one. Yes. Well, let's um, let's do the summary and uh, right now and then, and then come back to these, uh, these things. So Joseph, you're gonna do it for us? Sure. I think it's good that there's lots of holes so that there's opportunity to fill them in. <laughs> so what I think's happening, is we start off with um, the king in the storm 
starting to go crazy. Well, can we go back before that? Because I already have a question in scene one. Okay. Kent has this long speech that the notes in the Folger edition say, we patched things together to make Kent's speech intelligible. And my feeling at the end of it was, didn't work for me. I still <laughs> have no idea what he said. Um, so I know he says something about a conflict between Cornwall and mm -hmm. Albany, a brewing conflict. And I know that he's sending a message to Cordelia via a messenger and he's not revealing who he is, but Cordelia will know who he is when the messenger receives it. And that's about all that I understood from that. So what else is happening there? That sounded pretty good adding in that. Um, so you have, there's, we keep getting these rumors that, that Cornwall and Albany are gonna be uh, fighting with one another. But then what's added here is that France uh, has, has also, been paying attention to the divisions that are going on through their spies and that they are they've actually made some kind of landing or about to make a landing so that's a um, kind of just in general political terms that's what happens if you're if you're, going have, if, some, if you're going to have a civil war starting then powerful Somebody's. countries are really interested in can we step into this mess and get some kind of advantage but yeah. then also this is cordelia's husband so yeah Cordelia is is it is this connected with uh, Cordelia and they did their I can't remember I think it's Kent said that um, that they're coming to because of what's happening to Lear. Okay. So at least that's a possibility. Okay. So France, which is Cordelia, Cordelia is the good daughter, and then Albany and and Cornwall are also getting at each other, which is the husbands of Regan and and Cornwall. Mm -hmm. And so Ken's setting the stage that this this scene this whole act feels like the powder keg is getting mm -hmm. ready to blow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it starts to by the end of it. You, there's also there's a civil discord and international discord that's being added on to all of the personal turmoil that's going on. And just to make sure the seat the stage is set, so we've got Albany and Cornwall now own the they were split the empire between them. So they, they've got the kingdom between them. Gloucester is a landowner within this society. He's an important person. And he's got Edmund trying to get some power in there and cozy up to, to Cornwall by the end. So you've got all these like power struggles going on. And then Francis, we, we don't really know their intentions. Are we don't know what Francis is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we don't know if it's Cordelia urging them to come save King Lear or... Or France trying to get into the power play. So lots of yeah. ooh, scintillating drama. Um, <laughs> and that, so uh, it actually yeah. we don't want to look at this right now, but it reminds me of the Gloucester, Gloucester talk when he's talking about the eclipses and all the all the eclipses are forecasting, and then he's going through a list of bad things that have that are happening with connected with the eclipses. Mm. Uh, I think a lot of them are actually being played out in the drama here. Mm -hmm. mm. So after that scene, which I guess it's evident that I didn't understand it either because it didn't make it into my summary. <laughs> so where I started to get with it was King Lear in the in the storm um, that we had kind of set up from the last act. Then Kent comes to the rescue and finds him um, with the fool. Then Edgar comes pretending to be a fool and pretending to be a little out of it. Well, um, Edgar, no, just, Edgar was there already. They came to where was, Edgar okay. was in hiding. Yeah, so you can okay. see there's this, there's this enormous storm going on. Lear is insisting on being out in the storm, but there's some sort of little hut that Kent is trying to, Kent and the fool are trying to get um, Lear to go in there. When they finally look in there, then Edgar's already in that. Edgar's been hiding, uh, for being protected from the storm there. Yes, it's out, in the wilderness. it's out in the wilderness, and it's a little tiny thing that barely is going to hold up. Yeah, and it also means that Edgar didn't run away very far when he's running from his brother. Mm -hmm. He didn't go far, so I'm not sure what he's trying to do, or if he's really worried or not, or he wishes he would go mad so he wouldn't have to think about it. Like I don't know what Edgar's game is mm -hmm. exactly. Well, one uh, it might uh, help to remember that Gloucester said. We're going to send pictures to all the ports. Mm. So all the ports have a have some sort of picture of Edgar. So he can't go to the ports. He can't try to leave the country. 
So he's he probably just gone hide in into a, a wilderness area that mm -hmm. nobody that nobody goes into. That's his best hope for hiding. Okay. So can I ask a question that it, it might derail the summary a tiny bit? So if if it does, we can you can say to hold it off till later. But I had the sense, though I couldn't feel it quite, that this scene of Lear in the storm. Basically, I had the sense everybody makes paintings of of Shakespearean scenes. You know, it inspires them to turn, and this felt like a scene that would inspire the great artist to create an image. And it's the it's something like um, the feeling of madness mingled with the elements. Like he's the the madness becomes the storm, and the storm is his madness. Um, so I tried to, one question I had was, how would this be played? And related question, I assume Lear has to be a very imposing figure from the beginning. That's how I imagine him. And so that, seeing him in this scene, in the storm, imposing and but gone completely wild would be a really dramatic and moving moment. Does that sound, I mean, those who have seen performances, is that what it is? I think that, um, how did you react to the beginning when Lear is shouting at the storm mm -hmm. and he's just insisting on staying there and shout, what's, what's, your, what's your reaction to that? It felt to me like uh, what would stand in my, land, in my mind later for a kind of iconic poetic moment of wanting Destruct, desiring destruction because that's what's happening to you internally. And so the madness becomes a rage that's turned against the entirety. I mean, doesn't he call for, he's basically like calling for the um, earth to be wiped out of existence <laughs> in that scene, I think. So that is a powerful expression of internal turmoil. Um, so he doesn't want to hide from it. And it almost is like he's, reveling in and reveling doesn't sound right exactly but it, it uh yeah, he takes says, satisfaction yeah. in what's happening in nature mirroring what's happening inside of him yes he definitely has trouble thinking that there are other people with other experiences because he immediately thinks that Edgar must have a, a child who betrayed him because that's the only thing that could drive him to this. Only to this daughter. Area. He must have daughters. Only daughters. He daughters. must. <laughs> so he's definitely, I don't know if it's part of his senility or part of his character, but he's definitely got like main character, you know, energy. Like he sees himself as the person who is the universe. Like he is the royal we. He is like the whole world. Yeah, but he, so he says, oh. strike flat the thick rotundity of the world, crack nature's molds, all Germans spill at once that makes ungrateful man. Isn't he just calling for all of humanity to be wiped out? <laughs> Isn't that what that meant? Um, so yeah, it just seemed like a um, condensed and intensely dramatized version of want, like wanting to see your rage reflected on in in nature and in the world in general but what but what beautiful language lisa like i mean how the the whole thing is just magnificent his rage you know like it's not insanity it's not so prominent in this particular passage i think i think he's gradually falling apart and here it is his it is his rage in which he is calling uh, calling on nature to you know for the waters to rise and drown the land or the land to be thrown into the uh, water as the case may be. But just, if, if we just ignore the story and just like for for one moment and just like look at, <laughs> look at the language, you sulfurous and thought executing fires, want carriers of oak leaving thunderbolts, pinch my white head. And thou all shaking thunder, strike flat the thick rotundity of the, of the world. Crack nature's mold, all Germans spill at once that makes ungrateful man. Mm -hmm. And have you ever felt the like the world is so awful? Why doesn't God just destroy the whole? Can we just have nuclear war? Get it all <laughs> over with. It's so awful. Human beings are are the worst. We should never have any more of them. 
Mm -hmm. I, I haven't felt like that personally, but that is what this <laughs> <laughs> sounded like. <laughs> Andrew, it just it's, occurred it's, to me. It's, it's, it's not an uncommon human feeling to think right, just right. this this is so awful. Just wipe it all out. Right. Andrew, do you think that Molly also posted the same thing? It, I think it occurred to us at the same time. Like, do you think that Shakespeare could be the idea of water drowning uh, in a uh, drowning the steeples and the cocks, maybe yeah. reference to to uh, uh, the Noah's the flood that uh, from the Bible? Yeah. I, it's not it's I should have uh, seen that uh, connection before. So you are you're agreeing that it may experienced, um, has experienced a, a raging flood. It's it's an incredible thing. The, mm. the, uh, the amount of power that's that's unleashed when when a river is coming down um, is is pretty is really incredible. It's very incredibly destructive. Mm -hmm. So I I think that I don't know other other but you in. Um, you, you at least there's an admiration too for Lear in his in his rage, just being able to take all this on and not uh, I don't know, that he that he can shout at the elements and yeah. shout and and mm. and unleash it all from within is mm. uh, there's something great great about him in doing that. Mm. Well, it feels I guess part of what I was experiencing is that it would be a cathartic moment to consider when you have those moments, <laughs> the moments on the continuum that you described, this mm -hmm. would be um, the the ultimate expression of that feeling. Yeah. yeah. If you ever have that tumult inside, you're, you're like, the, you're mm -hmm. being, you, yeah, you have this, um, you're completely out of control internally. Mm -hmm. And then to be able to vent it like mm -hmm. that and rage, it's like, mm -hmm. wow, I wish you could do that sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> it was also well, striking that he does he does say a little bit later that he doesn't want to go inside because as long as the elements are beating him up, he's not going to be dwelling on his he, he's not going to dwell on his own in, internal state. So it is those distracting were, to him. Those were my favorite lines in the whole act, I think. So I have them handy. It's what but where the greater malady is fixed, the lesser is scarcely felt, is scarce felt. You know, the storm is in my brain. It's not outside. I can barely feel the one outside. Um, thou shun a bear, but if thy flight lay toward the roaring sea, thou meet the bear in the mouth. Um, when the mind's free, the body's delicate. When the mind is free, the body's delicate, but my mind is not free, so my body feels nothing. This tempest in my mind doth from my senses take all feeling save what beats there. Filial ingratitude. So the storm is nothing compared to the madness he's suffering over the ingratitude of his children. And I children. think of that, that line, that's 137, uh, 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 line 15, I have to read scene four. You want to pause after, save what beats there. This tempest in my mind up from my senses take all feeling else, save what beats there. Mm -hmm. Pause. Filial ingratitude. So th that, just by bringing it up again, he's now going back and feeling the pain all over again in mm -hmm. that in that switch uh, right in the middle of the line. Yeah. Yeah, this is further evidence for what we need for this because the language, I'm enjoying language so much more with all the context that's getting added to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I know there's something there I want to connect with. Um, just getting, getting to it is the challenge. Um, so just continuing with the summary, so we've got the king refusing to go into this little hut. Um, Edgar's inside of there, we discover in a bit. Kent's trying to get him in there out of the raging storm. And then Gloucester comes in the picture. I, I'm a little confused. I, I see Gloucester. I don't know. Does he come to this hut? Is he, why is he in the storm? Like what's, did I miss something? Like, I, I think he's at the hut and he, comes, he isn't ready. Yeah, he ahead. comes yeah. to yeah. get Lear. Cause yeah, then he, he knows that. No, go ahead. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, didn't he say to Edmund that I ha I have to go uh, go look for uh, look for Lear and bring him some relief? But we want to make sure that um, Cornwall doesn't find out. So why don't you go talk to Cornwall? And if he asks about me, tell him that I'm ill and I've gone to bed, something like that. Oh, I see. So, so, so maybe that's scene three. That's the beginning. That's scene yeah. three. Well, he God, says. So 
I like not this unnatural deal. He's learning what's going on. All the like conspiracies against the kingdom. And he doesn't like it. And he says, when I desired their leave that I might pity him, they took from me the use of mine own house, charged me on pain of, dis of perpetual displeasure, neither to speak of him and treat for him or any way to sustain him. So he's, he's going back, seeing what they're doing. He's going this back. This is from Act 2, what he saw in Act yeah. 2, the way yeah. that they treated, the way that they treated uh, Kent mm -hmm. uh, shocked him. I think he didn't he never would have expected that kind of behavior from Cornwall and Regan, who are his superiors. Uh, and then um, and then that they would let the king go. Mm -hmm. It's it's unbelievable to him that they would let the king go out into that storm and just write him off. So I think that that's, that's mainly what's on his mind here. Mm -hmm. I see. So Gloucester is having this awakening of they've crossed some lines from what he's willing to tolerate. The king now he finds out it's out in the storm. and And I think from what I learned later on, they're at his house. Like they're Cornwall and all of them are at his house. And and he finds out that they've essentially kicked Lear out of his house and he's wandering the storm. So he's now gonna go find him. So he comes comes upon it. He and doesn't he recognize even, yeah. He even says he'd die for it. Um I if I die for it, as no less has threatened me, the king, my own my old master must be relieved. So he had seen. I guess I, he now strikes me as the dupe that his son thinks he is, but kind of simple-mindedly good. And so once he figures out what the right thing is to do, he does the right thing. Mm -hmm. And Andrew, when you said he he didn't like what they were doing to Kent, you mean Kent in disguise from Act, act yes, Two? Yes. When, when, when they put they... him in the when they put him in the stocks, they I think that shocked him. Got it. And then, and then the way they treated the king when he came was was beyond his comprehension that any decent person could do that to somebody. I see. And so Gloucester finds them, goes to Kent, and they essentially say, "We got to help. We got to help him. We got to figure out." He's and Kent says he's going crazy, um, and Gloucester comes up with the plan to hide him and and send him off um, uh, to to can get I, out. And yeah. one more thing about Act Three. Um, so he says, Edmund, be careful. And Edmund says, this courtesy forbid thee shall the Duke instantly know. So as soon as his father's out the door, it's like, nope, I'm going straight to the Duke and telling him exactly what you're doing. So betrayal is instant. And one thought question I had is, um, does he, he's so completely evil through and through. And Edmund. It, yes. Does it come off to people as a character? It, I almost don't feel anything in regard to his behavior the way I feel much more outrage at Goneril and Regan than I do well no I, mean, I love Edmund's character and because in the first scenes we get we get a little glimpse into how he did like the resentment he holds on to so mm -hmm. it seems so plausible to me like you can kind of see how Gloucester's condescending to him at the beginning when he's talking with um who's Gloucester talking to at the very very beginning mm -hmm. uh is it Kent yeah and and, you know, Edmund's just kind of there. They're talking about him in front of them. They're talking about how he needs to learn. And now we know that he thinks he's smarter than, like he's, or he is clearly smarter than Gloucester. And he feels resentment for this system imposing on a bastard. Mm -hmm. And I can totally see how he's, he is who he is and the kind of like destructive nature he's going to have. I think mm -hmm. that, that seemed Maybe, maybe I'm projecting a little bit from what I've seen elsewhere on that type of character development, but mm -hmm. that part stood out to me from the first summary. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. he's the kind of person who bottles everything up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he had maybe a leer moment where he was out yelling, I don't know, about how angry he is to somebody else, maybe sharing, maybe as a therapist or something. He can talk to about how he feels really wronged um, by his family and the laws of the country, which don't allow bastards to inherit anything. Um, so he's just looking forward to an entire life, even as an adult, of being patronized to and you know talked mm -hmm. down to by his his brother who inherits everything. It seems as though if he had some legitimate way to I don't know unleash the fury, maybe he wouldn't be, I guess. But it seems like it just sits and festers in him, and that's why it's like he's he has this complete double life. Like he's so you know Gloucester trusts him completely, and it seems as though that's because he's built up this front of being the respectful, kind, helpful son. Um, and so I don't know, I guess maybe it's, it's 
the strain it looks like on him to always put up that front that it looks like the it seems like the resentment i think that's just how he gets the way he is because he doesn't ever let it out to anybody so he channels everything all of his own rage he channels it into manipulation and uh exploitation it's just a single track now that's an interesting thing because i did i listened to the the last part of the discussion last week um Mm -hmm. it's it's i think it's an interesting take on edmund says i would have been this way anyway yeah right Mm -hmm. it's all me but we're saying no i mean it's you're you you've got issues yeah that, are, that have really driven you this way so um at least well, that's I don't know. my question does Edmund really know himself that way hmm. but I don't, I don't necessarily say it's just it's still how he chooses to interpret right. and right. handle the external circumstances so it's not I don't say it's this thing that was imposed on him right he's in a context and he's he's making a choice to right. you know inter- go down the path of resentment instead of because we, also- we even get the contrast of Gloucester we see him almost second guessing whether he like he was almost preemptively going to give Edmund favor, and I, th- I think that happens earlier, right? Like Gloucester's talking about how he prefers Edmund and and mm-hmm. you know maybe hopes to give him some privilege. So you know you kind of get to see that it's not like this world is against Edmund. That's just how he's choosing to see it. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think it's also... it's... Go ahead. Well, it's just interesting, too, because he says, oh, I would have been like this no matter what. And then he's mocking people for saying that the stars have anything to do with things. But he has the same kind of deterministic idea about the world where he's like, he doesn't seem to think he's chosen how he is. He's saying, oh, I I just am this way. I'm not going to say it's the stars, but it's completely set and there's nothing I could have done about it. So it's just Hmm. he's kind of a hypocrite. Like, I don't that's why him not understanding himself kind of that makes a lot of sense to me because it seems like his idea of the world doesn't really make sense either. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that stands out in um, with regard to a number of aspects of his play is the way in which the, the people that you care about can't imagine, they can't conceive of people being as bad or have situations being becoming as bad as they are as as they as they do um so edmund is able to get away with all of this because gloucester and edgar can't imagine that anybody would be as wicked as he is um so it puts all the power but then then i'm wondering is he is it believable do you think there can be people like this really in the world that Mm. you should be careful about who are super smart who are able, they can read everybody. They know they they mm-hmm. they they have that gift of being able to read everybody and know what their motivations are and know how to manipulate them. Mm-hmm. Who would then choose to manip- to do to break out of all restraint and mm-hmm. tear people down when when it's convenient to them? Is it believable? Mm-hmm. I've always had a hard time. I've never you know, with the characters. I, I have no problem imagining that the heroes I like from literature could exist. But I always have a challenge, on that, especially the more honest villains that recognize what they're doing is evil. I always, I can never imagine that they can actually exist if they can see what they're doing. In some uh, cases, the worst case. So you is, don't, you don't ever read the news, Joseph. You, you yeah. don't read the papers. <laughs> I don't, dis- I don't discount that evil can exist, but I, I have trouble with the sort of when evils presented from like, like especially the most nihilistic kinds, where they recognize something is good and they still want to tear it down to me that's like yeah i relate to that feeling but i also relate to the feeling of not being able to imagine people lying to me but Mm -hmm. there's been many instances in my life where i like i have like i was a prefect at school so i had to enforce the rules and there'd be times where people would be doing something and i would walk up and say hey are you doing that thing you're doing and they would look me in the eyes and say no and it's like like there people are comfortable lying and like I just had to I went to an estate sale and people are cutthroat it's bizarre and this guy like manufactured a whole lie to me for basically like for no reason I could see because he was worried I was wanting the same thing that he was wanting at the estate sale but and, and like those are things where it's like those are not things 
I think that people do, but unfortunately in my life, like people do them. And so just, I haven't had an experience as intense as knowing someone like, I can't get the names right. Which one is he? Edmund. Edmund, Edmund sorry. The two Eds, whatever, what Ed, the bad one does. Um, yeah. Like I have no experience of someone that bad, but I have these like smaller experiences where I'm like, no one would ever do that. And then people do it and I'm like, oh, well, I also think no one would ever do that. But unfortunately I've been proved wrong in other spheres. So it seems like I might, I don't know, like the more extreme cases might exist too. And so you're, one yeah. of the things you see here is that, uh, you, as a decent person, you're vulnerable. <laughs> if you yeah. don't, if you don't properly take into your uh, mind and imagination that, oh, people that you meet, they might not be decent. But the thing that struck me about Gloucester is in a, in a sense, it almost seems to me a virtue that an honest person has a hard time believing someone could be dishonest. That seems like they can't relate to it because it's not part of their soul. So it's so foreign that it's that you just take people at their word. And yes, that makes you vulnerable, but it seems a better alternative. Yeah, something but, was, but, oh, I'm sorry, just went to, with, with the Gloucester. It wasn't just that he took Edmund at his word. It's that he so completely turned against Edgar, who he had no reason to doubt. So that's the part that struck me as the real weakness in them. Not that he would be trusting and naive and believe in um, Edmund's words, but that Edgar's just out like that <laughs> with no evidence presented, no real evidence. Sorry, go ahead, Cecilia. I was just going to say like, yeah, Greta, I totally agree. Cause I had a situation like that first year teaching. And I had, I had a student who had, you know, been picking on another student and I observed it. And then I pulled the student aside afterwards and talked to her and she just, she just lied to my face. She was like, no, I, I didn't do that. And, and I completely second guessed myself. I was like, shoot, like maybe I just, you know, maybe I was totally wrong. And so I just kind of, I ended up like, you know, talking to her about it, but I kind of let her off the hook. Like I didn't punish her or anything. And then afterwards, I was thinking about it and I was like, I feel like such an idiot because I just let somebody, you know, I, I thought about it afterwards and I put some pieces together and I was like, just decided that she actually had, you know, I was like, clearly this was a lie, but it was weird because I was like simultaneously kicking myself for believing her. And I was like, I'm such a, I'm so such a fool. But then I was like, wait a second, but I'm not used to assuming that everyone's lying to me. So it was just like, I didn't, I don't know. Yeah. It's like, you don't want to become really hardened and cynical either and assume that everyone's always lying to you. Um, because then you have, to, you, have, like, you have to learn to be properly skeptical. attuned and 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 uh, realize, especially if as you if you were to advance in political influence um, or uh, ecclesial or social influence, you become uh, as you if you were to rise in the realms of power. Mm -hmm. and you're doing good you want to do good with it the mm -hmm. more you're going to encounter you have to you have to be properly cautious about the assumptions that you have about what decent people will be doing but at the yeah, same i think it's part of understanding of, it's a part of a full understanding of justice and that that there is this alternative that it's naive to only have the one-sided view even though it is good to give people the benefit of the doubt, but to not understand that there is this opposite side and that it's powerful and, and can wreak problems and, and to be alert to it. And I think that's part of what Shakespeare is helping us imagine is that, no, there really is another side to how people can behave. In some ways, it's also a warning to, if you happen to be one of those people like Edmund, who have that kind of talent and have that kind of insight and have that that kind of an ability to manipulate people. Um, look at what you might become. At least Shakespeare's on to you. And, <laughs> he's, yeah. he's sort of warning them. I'm on to you. I know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's it's, a... it's important to identify <clears throat> the elements, even if it's an extreme character that we can't relate to in any way. It's always important to look for those elements in your own soul in a really and even in the minutest of ways. Um, mm -hmm. Ian. Oh, no, I was just going to add that, um, yeah, he's showing us that uh, people can be like this, but it also feels like he's commenting on the system of hereditary position 
in England that people can reach such a vaunted position and still be so naive. You know, Andrew said it behooves you the further mm. you go in politics to be more alert to this sort of thing. And yet here we have one of the earls of the, of the realm who's so credulous and, you know, mm -hmm. because most of these people were just born into their role and complete amateurs really at what they were doing. Yeah, we're, we're all decent people. We're decent guys, you know, and, uh, you know, we, we have our flings, we have our kids, our kids out of wedlock and stuff, but we're all pretty good guys and we wouldn't do anything terrible like this, right? Mm -hmm. jo jolly good chaps, I think they'd be called. <laughs> I think well, yeah, that's... Um, it's also a period in England when the, when the rise of a kind of Machiavellian, um, a Machiavellian attitude in both the leaders and in the, the civil servant class is is becoming more has, has already had a big effect over the last you know uh 100 years or something before shakespeare's uh doing this stuff so yeah because with with the trying to see, like know knowing if edmund is like a real guy or not or could be a real person what what he is in some way i think it's just a personification of what happens if you really give way to envy like if you really let yourself um mm -hmm. want what someone else has in this kind of unchecked manner and like mm -hmm. yeah he's saying that's what you become when you give into that mm -hmm. all right i appreciate his character a lot more after this conversation <laughs> yeah. okay so, so what are we like scene four yeah. <laughs> i don't know the scenes but we're at um the the fate my fate well most intense part of the act at least so I gather that Edmund's gone right to Cornwall to tell him that Gloucester is going to help. Mm -hmm. Gloucester and Regan essentially say, you better get out of here because you're not going to like what we're about to do to Gloucester. Gloucester comes back after having hopefully concealed and sent King Lear off um, with Kent. Gloucester comes back and they spring the trap on him and, and um, you know, get him bound, try to find out where where King Lear is and, and get the truth out of him. And then you get just the gruesome scene of them poking an eye out. I think the most tragic part for me was just the description of um, one of the servants trying to help and Regan coming up behind him and stabbing him in the back. That's what I assumed happened. I can just imagine just based off the description that just cowardly comes and stabs the only defender, um, then pokes Gloucester's other eye out and um just i see where where raj was trying to warn me last time where this is going um in terms of gruesome endings so i guess the, the power keg is lit now gloucester who i imagine is some person of importance with allies has just been killed by cornwall and he doesn't have any allies he's got not no dead. allies he's, he's not, not dead. dead sorry sorry no. but he's poked his eyes out he's they, they've he's they've made the, the first yeah. Yeah, they made a first move. They've certainly attacked him. And I assume now everything's going to hit the fan. And, and um, you know, that first that first big move's been made. Um, so I think Kent, at this point where we leave the scene, uh, Kent's with King Lear trying to smuggle him out somewhere. Um, Cornwall and Regan have, you know, are torturing Gloucester to try and find out where he is. France is coming with Cordelia, potentially. We don't really know what they're doing, maybe to the rescue. Um, and it's really Albany and um, Cordelia, or no, sorry, I'm, Goneril are going to have something to say about it. J just to be clear, Regan's with Cornwall, Goneril's with Albany somewhere else. They are also not happy with each other. They're not on the same side anymore. Now that they've disposed of the king or, or taken his power, they've turned their attention to each other. And I assume things are going to get bloodier. Yeah, we don't seem to know much about that, just that that's true. Um, Joseph, if you want a tip for remembering who's with who, I do it alphabetically. Mm -hmm. So Regan and Goneril. Goneril's first because she's alphabetically first. <laughs> so she's with Albany, who's before Cornwall. Got it. Little, like little mnemonic trick there for you. That was good too. Um, oh, yeah, good and malicious. At a so, some point during the week, I texted Andrew and said, I'm going to assume that after Act Three, there will be no remaining Goneril or Regan sympathizers. So <laughs> we were expressing 
some kind of sympathy for their condition. So just in case, I'd like to make the final case for no sympathy for them. Um, I would also like to make sure that I'm not being categorized yeah. as a regan or goneral sympathizer, because <laughs> that was not what I was saying. I was just saying, if we want to think about what the right thing to do in this situation would be, it's not just let his hundred men like wreak havoc on their house. Okay. Anyways, that's you all. are you are defended. Um, I, so, I also hope I'm exonerated yeah. in some capacity. Okay, I'm teasing you both. I don't really think you you were fond of them. Um, <laughs> I think I maybe felt a little more uncomfortable than than either of you even exploring what could one could sympathize with in their position because I just was so focused on how awful they are. But anyway, hang out, hang him instantly, pluck out his eyes. I mean, no hesitation. That was bad enough, but worse by far, I think, was after his eyes are plucked out. Um, Oh, and the juxtaposition. Okay, so one of the most dramatic moments in the whole thing is that Gloucester is calling for Edmund after his eyes have been, because that's his source of comfort and support. Regan turns on him and says, thou callest on him that hates thee. So they've just plucked out their his eyes. Now they're telling him the son you think loves you doesn't even love you. So then he realizes in this moment with Edgar right next to him, um, then Edgar was abused. Forgive me that, I mean, he had just been with Ed Edgar. Forgive me that I prosper him. And their response, Regan's response to that is go thrust him out at gates and let him smell his way to Dover. That those are the most chilling. And just the fact that it's at his house, right? The betrayal he feels like you can see how he's, he's a little bit more simple than he's not sophisticated. And just so like the shock he has that they're betraying him in his own home and no one's standing with him. Oh, talk about a violation of hospitality duties <laughs> like we see in ancient Greece the uh, the duty to provide shelter and a bed and and food to any wayward traveler <laughs> and here it's being completely turned mm -hmm. into the most evil possible oh and one thing i just wanted to say about the the evil and the you know being on guard against evil this is a universe in which that has the most power i mean this this is a world where being evil it will is I mean it does make you succeed, but you're vulnerable to it because it has more power being evil than this, being this good. world. You mean Lear or this world? We Lear, oh, no, okay. sorry, Lear, the world of Lear. Um, so while we might apply that to our own world or see it reflected in a no another novel where you can't just be a dupe and you have to be suspicious of the possibility, you have to be alert to the possibility of evil. It seems so much more significant here that that. It's no, I don't get this. I don't get the sense Shakespeare setting us up for a and they lived happily ever after ending. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know if evil is going to succeed necessarily. But I do get the sense that if they had their wits about them, they could have stopped it. I don't. I don't. I don't get the sense that it was unstoppable and unavoidable, and they're mm. doomed. I get the sense that if Lear had been wise before he got old, and if if um, Gloucester had, you know, not been so naive, um, then I think that they could have stopped it. Move. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's I also the, like that's what... what, well, that's what they say about tragedy, right? Is that there has to be like the tragic flaw, mm -hmm. right? Or like, mm -hmm. if it's just completely unwarranted, then it's harder to be sympathetic. Whereas if it's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, this is a flawed human being and they have, they're a good person ultimately, but they have this one flaw and then that's the cause of their destruction. Yeah. That's what makes it really sympathetic. Yeah. I really like the way um, Greta summarized it before, just not just for Edmund, but for the daughters too. It's such a great concentrated presentation of envy and the consequences of letting envy rule. Like they all, because you see it first, mm. they're just nervous about how he treated Cordelia and protected, but now they become envious of each other after they have the kingdom. And it's just, Envy breeds more envy, and it, they're never satiated. They just have to keep, keep going. So it's oh, you just see how it all can only lead in destruction. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, I thought it was um, really stupid of Reagan to 
tell Gloucester that Edmund is not actually on his side. Like that's that's information. And now mm. he knows that. Mm. Uh it's not very like kind of maybe con com, um contrasting to your point, Lisa, that Evo is powerful here. That was a very mm. stupid thing of her to do and uh, not very smart. So and maybe know, just sure in the happen. impulse of the moment she wanted she wanted to hurt him yeah. in that moment she and also um she also just said there's nothing uh, there's nothing to fear from him anymore we've completely mm -hmm. we've completely eliminated him as a concern so we can do what we can let him do whatever he wants um it is it is oh that's like the, that right that, sorry the, sorry but that's like the um i don't know what word to use that some kind of contrasting thing between the declaration of love for Lear, like the raw, so that was the complete false presentation of devotion. And then the reality at the other extreme is now that I have nothing to gain from him, mm. this is how I treat a human being. So this is how I treat a human being when there's something to gain. This is how I treat a human being when there's nothing left to gain. Um, Even when there's no nothing to be gained from torturing him further with this knowledge, I'm going to do it just because I enjoy torturing. This. Come on up with that. Isn't, this it, um, isn't it striking how, um, to me, hanging him, plucking his eyes out is a much grosser, more horrific thing to do than to hang him. Mm -hmm. Goneril, so Regan says hang him, like that's terrible, but to pluck his eyes out and then just let him go that is that is horrible um i wonder if that's supposed to be slightly poetic because he like was so blind to what was happening with his sons too it also um it, it can't help but remind me of oedipus at colonus so oedipus you know it's famous uh, for stabbing his own eyes out in oedipus rex but the oedipus at colonus is what it's like for him as an old man old blind man now being led around by his daughter so um, we'll, we're going to see more of that coming up. Are there characters, other characters in Shakespeare who get their eyes plucked out? Is this a, is it? No, really okay, so it's anyway. unique. It's fine, and it's said to be. To have, it do, have it be done on stage is shocking. And it's like, a, as a director, that's like, how do you get, how do you actually work it out that they can, they can realistically pluck these eyes out on stage and then have the blood and the, you know, all that happen. It's interesting to work at. Mm -hmm. One of the most probably it has been said that this is the most horrific scene uh, ever in the history of drama. Like to see to have the person you, they're not talking about the eyes being plucked out, but you see the eyes being plucked out uh, on stage. It's it's, uh, it's incredible. And then regarding Reagan for for the sympathizers, quote unquote in quotes, uh, she she not only says pluck his eyes out, but when he plucked one eye out. She says the one will mock the other or something like that and says, well, let's do the other one also. Mm -hmm. So Regan is way worse than Goneril. It's, this is similar to when Kent was put in the stockade. He said until tonight, she says not till tonight, till tomorrow or something and, like that. And Cornwall is worse than Albany. He, he is right involved in this, whereas Albany put up a little bit of a fight <laughs> against yeah. Goneril, but he is all the way involved in this. I, I found that a little bit I don't know, surprising, but um, interesting because given that there's some apparent rivalry between them, I thought so that they would pick up on what Michelle, Michelle put in the chat that what are we seeing? So we've got, that's the horrific side of it. Um, what about Kent and the mm -hmm. Fool and Edgar? Um, how, and, how and the two servants in this. And the two servants in this. Scene. Uh, Even the two servants came around and would have nothing to do with this. Yeah, there are there are lines. Um, but then yeah. what, what are we seeing from those characters? And how, uh, I guess, yeah, let's focus on that. And how is Lear impacted by them? Mm -hmm. for, the, for the servants, um, they're taking the advice of, I think, Kent or someone toward the beginning, because someone said at the beginning, I think it was Kent, that the problem if some servants is that they become sycoph sycophantic mm -hmm. and that's when things like really like go off the rails like when the good like bows down or when people in the, those kind of positions 
uh, feeding into the impulses rather than the reason of the people in power. And that's when like things go bad. And these servants are the opposite of whoever he was referring to. Like they're the ones like saying up and doing the right thing and yeah, following the advice. Uh, and Edgar, that was one of the first in, in um, him talking about his suppose how you know his supposed evil that he's done. He starts out um, in line ninety of Act Three, Scene Four. Uh, I was a serving man, proud in heart and mind, that curled my hair, wore gloves in my cap, served the lust of my mistress's heart, and did the act of darkness with her. So this, uh, the, the, he starts out with this idea of the servant who will who will do whatever. Will, satis uh, will satisfy the appetites of their superior. Where was that, Andrew? Sorry, that was line 90 in scene four. Okay, cool. Um, and if we're, well, also in regard to Kent and Edgar, one of the moments that I found the most touching, it's act it's scene six, line 60, about. Um, Kent says to Lear, oh, pity, sir, where is the patience now that you so oft have boasted to retain? I think this is just after they have, he has the bizarre mock trial of Goneril and Regan, and Kent can see he's completely losing his mind. And then Edgar aside says, my tears begin to take his part so much, they mar my counterfeiting. He's afraid he's going to not be able to keep up his disguise anymore because he's being brought to tears at what he's seeing. Oh, and also, where was the where were the lines about? I think these were my other favorite lines about. Um, uh, oh, it's scene six, also line one twelve. Um, Edgar says, "When we when we our betters see bearing our woes." We scarcely think our miseries are foes. Um, so he's, Edgar himself is suffering, but seeing Lear, whom he considers his better suffer, makes him forget about his own woes because he, he feels so much more strongly for him. And then, um, but then the mind much sufferance, sufferance doth or skip when grief hath mates and bearing fellowship. How light and portable my pain seems now when that which makes me bend makes the king bow. Oh, those are good lines. I noted those, those are those are some of my favorite <laughs> lines. This that love for the hero. Like I you think I'm having problems. Like this guy who I love is like, how can I complain? It was so good. Oh, it was so good. I think awesome. that's just true about all four of the of the characters that encounter Lear in this act. It's pity that really overwhelms them. The, the even the fool is like, can you get? Can you go back? Can you? They 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 feel intense pity for all that Lear is suffering, but also Lear is starting to feel pity for the fool, and especially for Edgar. That in seeing mm, Edgar, yeah. he is like being opened up to. Mm -hmm. The fact that, oh, there's a whole world of sufferers out there that I've never paid attention to. Yeah. All the poor who who are like this, I've never paid attention to them. Um, and and so that's that's making him it's helping him in some ways to get to get beyond his own suffering, at least to see there's collaborators and then even being willing to be led to be taken to be taken care of to some extent. Mm. There's a line that I really like about that um in act three scene four it's like around line 30 and he says poor naked wretches what wears soever you are that by the pelting of this pitiless storm um how shall your houseless heads and unfed sides um etc 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 um oh i've taken too little care of this take physic pomp expose thyself to feel what wretches feel that thou mayst shake the superflux to them and show the heavens more just and at least in my thesis when i wrote about this i was arguing that that's really a turning point in his character where he's He's going from just being, um, you know, thinking about his own sorrows or um, noticing how other people have hurt him. He's saying, oh, shoot, you know, I'm the king. I should be taking care of these people. Um, mm. And it's like that's mm. his character growth of realizing that he's done wrong. Because at the mm. beginning of the play, he's clearly doing wrong and he's seeing it as completely just. And it's 
you know, so like he's, he's kind of come a long way from, from act one, scene one, I think. Yeah, and that is interesting that the characters around him who love him, that's one of their dominant qualities is to be able to do that. But but it's all directed at him rather than him seeing it in the other direction until that moment. So then in the uh, midst of all, yeah, go ahead. I just wanna stress one part that I loved about those lines um, so much from Edgar though, is that we, I was just reading a scene in Hugo's 93 with my students and there's a scene where they discover a general who's been in hiding and the person who had taken command in his absence gives his sword to the general and he says, I now have a higher rank, I'm your servant. And it's such a great, such a great line. And they they all, the students always love that one. But there's a similar element here. It's like my suffering means less because of the suffering of my superior, of this person that I'm looking up to matters more to me in this moment than my own suffering. So I just found that beautiful. Oh, I wanted to bring up one uh, one other text and see what you think about it. So this is in scene four as well, 107. Um, he's speaking to Edgar. Thou wert better in a grave than to answer with thy uncovered body this extremity of the skies, which is ironic because that's what he's been doing himself, <laughs> um, though he's not completely uncovered. Is man no more than this? Consider him well. Thou owest the worm no silk, the beast no hide, the sheep no wool, the cat no perfume. Ha, ah, here's three on us are sophisticated. Thou art the thing itself. Unaccommodated man is no more but such a poor bare forked animal as thou art. Off, off you lendings. Come unbutton here. What do you think of that? So I, I have something I think interesting to say for that. Um, because I think Edgar is talking about in his, in sleeping with the contriving of lust and waked to do it. Um, this is like the whore master man that Edmund was talking about, that man people, you know, were just given to their, their lusty goals and the just the whims and pleasures they want to seek. And Edgar is the person who kind of sees that and totally like renounces like, like everything. And he's therefore unaccommodated man. He's got nothing. But then when you do that to yourself, you, you're better dead than to live. Um, and so this like Edgar's like, what happens like when you see Edmund and you're so afraid and like Edgar, like the, the disguise Edgar, not like the actual. So this disguise Edgar is like, yeah, if I'm going to battle my nature, my horror master man nature, I gotta just get, you know, just get everything off, renounce everything. And then, you know, I'll be good. But then when you actually do that, it's not a life worth living. I don't know if that makes sense. But that's what I took from it. Can you tell me where the lines are again? Because I. Sorry, it was missed. line um, one, 107. In which scene? Scene four, page 141. Okay, okay 141. So there's another part, it, I think in scene two, but I can't find it, where um, Lear is talking about his his men, his hundred men, and he says, and I think Reagan or Goneril says, you don't need that many. And he's like, well, if I if people only have what they need, then we're no more than beasts. And I think that this is a similar thing that he's trying to say is that like, what, what makes a person more than just an animal? It's, and, and I don't know, it's like almost like he's saying the opposite thing here, where he's saying Egder without his clothes, without anything extra, without even his reason, somehow that's really what a man is. Or what a human is but so i don't know if he's changed his mind or if he's saying something different i'm not sure do you guys what do you think about like the two together that's a great question that's back in act two um on page 117 act two scene four line 305 our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous 
And now allow not nature more than nature's needs. Man's life is as cheap as a beast. Is that is that what Lear is seeing here now in Edgar? This is man. And it's nothing more than a beast. Nothing more than a beast. And also just with a couple of wrong moves, you can go from being the king to being out on a windy moor, naked, having lost your kingdom and how fragile everything is. And then I just read this as uh, Shakespeare's view of humans, really, or Shakespeare's view of man, that we're just, oh. you know, two, two creatures that happen to have two legs, but we're not, not much more than that. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that it is. Or is it Lear just being sort of self-pitying? Um, and saying, oh, well, I, if I can't have all of that, then I guess I'm really nothing. So maybe that, that's where his sense of himself or his sense of, you know, self-worth came from, was having all these things around him. And now that he doesn't have them, he doesn't even think of himself as human anymore. I don't know if that's necessarily what Shakespeare thinks, but it's definitely what Lear seems to think at this point. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember whether the part where um, Lear is, uh, Lear talks about how he's been blind to the poor. It happens before that text that I just read. Or was it after? It's before. It's before. Like a pages before. Yeah, so that's it. Oh, it's still in that same scene, 32 ish. Poor naked wretches, wheresoever you are, that bide the pelting of this pitiless storm. How shall your houseless heads and unfed sides, your looped and widowed raggedness, defend you from seasons such as these? Oh, I have taken, taken too little care of this. Take physic, pomp. Expose thyself to feel what wretches feel that thou may shake the superflux to them and show the heavens more just. So uh, in so, he's, he's like taking a second look at these superfluities that he said, I, I'm nothing. If I don't have all these extra things, then I'm nothing more than a beast. And then he, it seems like here he's realizing, but those very things have prevented me from really seeing the human, the human condition. If I strip myself of all of them, then I can experience the suffering that these that people like Edgar endure, and then I'll be moved. I'll actually be moved to to try to do something for them. So it's 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 complex. Should we pause there for today? Yes, sounds good. Now let's see. Uh, uh, I'm interested in in the light of our the beginning of our conversation. I'm interested. One, if you could pick one of the scenes to go back and reread now and see if that's see if it makes a lot more sense to you after discussion. That would be promising. And maybe uh, maybe watch a film version of that of this part and see how it how it helps and how it meet, matches up with things you've seen in the reading. Um, mm. Is there is there a um, film version that you recommend? Um, no, my, my my problem is that the best Lear thing I've seen done was it done at Thomas Aquinas College years ago, and it's just like seared into me, and I've never seen okay. anything like that. That's um, amazing. But Raj, you, you had a couple that you were recommending that were are, are available. Is he still there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, but was your question about the recordings? Yeah, Which, or video. Was there the video one was that you liked the yeah. best? Okay, wait. Yes. So 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 two I like two of them and they are they are slightly different. Both are very, very good. Uh, both are surprisingly directed by the same person, Richard Iyer. E Y R E. They are available free on Prime Video, both of them. The mm -hmm. difference is that the one with Ian Holm, H O L M as King Lear, is the traditional version. And then there's the one with Anthony Hopkins, which is the same text, the words, but it is uh, set in modern times and I thought that would kind of ruin it for me, but actually I, it did not. I would highly recommend both versions. Mm -hmm. uh, e by Ari is the director. Ian Holm is the, uh, as King Lear is the older. Anthony Hopkins as uh, King Lear is the newer version. Both are very good. Okay. Let me, last thing is that um, you mentioned something about the uh, an iconic character to scenes like this. I have mm -hmm. found that in, in many of the Shakespeare plays, 
there are there's like one scene where as a director you think this is iconic the image the image that's being portrayed that, that's going to be on stage is more important in some ways than dramatic interchange and i think that that's definitely true of this of these scenes particularly of the trial scene um mm -hmm. when you have all four of them there who are suffering in different ways so okay all right um, well, thank you all can I say one quick thing last? I want I want to send this around out of curiosity. You, you mentioned earlier the thing about modern performances trying to do something that will kind of pander to or appeal to audiences. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. There was this viral video that went around a while ago of the to be or not to be speech as just the most magnificent performance of this speech ever done. And I found it very distasteful. Um, and I'm curious to see whether it falls into the category you're describing, because it was, I think, trying to, with gestures, humanize the character in a way that would make people relate to him by the by the gestures. But anyway, I don't want to say too much, but I might just send that out to this group um, to see whether you have the same reaction that I did or whether you agree I also think this is masterful and i'm missing what's masterful about it so i'll i'll send that for people's and yeah. i just have a couple more quick announcements um we have a few more spots left for the uh discussion of heim Gnotz between parent and child um so if you do want to register that for that um feel free to message me or email me if you don't know about it or don't know how to register but there's an email circulating and i'm sure we'll send another one um and then this was kind of last minute, but I'm also, I'm, I started giving a course on the history of astronomy um, to ARC UK members. I sent an email about it uh, yesterday. It's every Saturday morning. Today's was just a uh, introduction. It's it's almost right before this group discussion. So if you feel like having back-to-back -back Joseph in your life, then <laughs> feel free to join um, that. Uh, the real course material will really start next week and and there's plenty of room for for more people. So if you're interested in the history of astronomy, in getting a glimpse, I would say, into Van Damme Academy, if I might be so bold, um, and, and have some of the teaching methods go on there, then definitely join that every Saturday morning. And, and I've emailed the read with the audience, um, but feel free to reach out to me if you want more information. Great. Okay, thanks, everyone. Thank I will see you next week from Paris. I'll be the one enjoying baguettes and croissants while we discuss. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, everyone.